Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? All good? Cool. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. it's not the most um, uh, amazing subject to be talking about, ghost nets, but uh, I appreciate you coming here. It is quite an important uh, subject. It's one that has quite relevance in, in the Maldives. Um, but before I kind of get into the seminar, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background information about where the Olive Ridley project came from. Um, I first came to the Maldives in 2012. Uh, and back then, I was working at a rehabilitation center in, at the Four Seasons. Um, but during my time there, I noticed there was many turtles that were coming in entangled in uh, fishing nets. And some of the injuries that they were uh, sustaining were quite horrific, really deep lacerations around their, their flippers, sometimes amputations, even double amputations on occasion. So they really were quite shocking. But at that time, there was nobody really paying any attention to what was causing the problem. So it was actually this sort of material that we were finding. It was wrapping around these turtles. So um, what we decided to do is uh, concentrate our efforts on, on the actual ghost net to find out um, certain specifications of it. To, uh, so we take webbing dimensions, twine diameter, knot construction. We basically try and work out everything about uh, this net to try and understand where it's actually coming from. Uh, who might be responsible and what our recommendations could be from that. So I pretty much dedicate my time now to uh, researching ghost nets in the Indian Ocean in the Maldives, also in India, Sri Lanka, and now over in, uh, recently in Oman as well. So we are expanding and that's kind of where we are at the moment. So I think the best place to kind of start would be to just explain what a ghost net is. Um, a ghost net is any abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing net that can be at sea or on land. Um, the reason why they're lost or abandoned could be numerous reasons. Generally speaking, fishermen don't really want to lose their, their fishing nets because they're very expensive. Uh, so a lot of the time it could be because of bad weather. Maybe coastal communities are drying their fishing nets out near the uh, coast. Bad weather comes in and throws all the fishing gear into the sea, and that's how they lose uh, their gear. Or it could be a little bit more sinister. Potentially they're illegal fishing, and to make a quick escape, they cut their fishing nets, and that's how they can, uh, they can get away really quickly. So there's numerous reasons why ghost nets uh, do occur. The term ghost fishing, and as this kind of picture clearly shows, ghost fishing is the continued trapping and killing of marine organisms. Now, unfortunately, with ghost fishing, it doesn't really show any sort of prejudice. Um, it can target species like sharks, also turtles, uh, mantas on occasion, uh, cetaceans. So really a whole array of marine organisms. Um, the true quantity of, of the effects of ghost fishing is not really well documented, especially in the Indian Ocean. So we don't really know how many marine organisms are actually trapped in this way. Um, and also the efficiency of the, the lost fishing gear to, uh, to capture animals depends on the condition it was left in. So, for instance, if a fishing net was left in situ, if it was abandoned, for instance, it would be running at 100% capacity. So it would be continuing to trap all those marine organisms very, very effectively. However, if it was just a damaged piece of net uh, and they throw that overboard, then it's not going to be running quite so efficiently, so maybe around uh, 10%. Uh, there's also stories of ghost nets um, catching marine organisms, and the weight becomes so heavy that the ghost net sinks to the bottom of the seabed. And then all the scavengers come in, the crabs, the lobsters, they start feeding on, on the catch, and then the net comes back up to the surface because it becomes buoyant, and then the whole process starts again. And this can go on for maybe six, seven hundred years, so a very long time indeed. <clears throat> There's four general types of ghost nets uh, in the Maldives. Um, the first one that we encounter is this type, so this is kind of the one I brought with me as well today. It's generally just one color, uh, and if you measure this, if you take webbing dimensions, uh, it's generally of one webbing dimension. So we can safely say that this is probably coming from one particular fishery, maybe one particular area as well. The second type of fishing net that we encounter uh, is a fishing net that's associated with a structure. Uh, this particular structure is known as an FAD, and an FAD is a fish aggregating device which does exactly that. It just attracts fish so that fishermen can go in and start fishing all the whatever is underneath. Uh, unfortunately, we are finding quite a large proportion of, uh, of FADs drifting into the Maldives. Um, more cryptic, we have these kind of nets that are generally monospecific, but they're submerged underwater. <clears throat> so it makes finding them very difficult. Um, because obviously you can't see them from the surface. Also makes removal very difficult because often they're just entangled in fishing nets, uh, sorry, entangled in coral. So when you try and pull the, the, the fishing net, it's actually really difficult to remove. 
And then the most common type of fishing net that we find, or ghost net, sorry, uh, is this type. This is just a, a huge conglomerate of fishing nets. So if I was to go in and, and take pieces of, of the net on all these samples, what I would find is many different nets with many different mesh sizes, different twine diameters. So they're probably coming from different fisheries and different areas. And what's happening is they're actually going in oceanic currents. They're merging together in these gyras to form these huge conglomerates. And then when the gyra is released, they just drift over to the Maldives. Um, unfortunately, with these types of nets, they're massive. They're absolutely huge. So um, to try and remove these from the ocean takes quite a lot of manpower. <clears throat> so what are, what are fishing nets made of? Well, predominantly, uh, they're made of polypropylene or nylon. Uh, that's generally the two main types of fishing nets that, that are around. Um, when we talk about fishing nets and materials, it's quite important to talk about density. So density is, how, is whether it's going to float in the surface of the seawater or whether it's going to sink. Um, polypropylene has a density of around 0.85, but when you compare that to nylon, which is 1.3, uh, what you can see now is that nylon is going to actually sink to the bottom and polypropylene is going to be floating on the top, which is interesting because I took over about 20 samples back to the UK, which is where I'm from. Uh, to get them ID to see what materials they're made of. And it turned out that all 20 samples were polypropylene. So the majority of these fishing nets that we find are made of polypropylene, not nylon. However, if you go over to India, it's a slightly different story. A lot of the data that we're getting from India uh, is actually a single filament, which is just a monofilament. This is a multi-filament um, nylon. And they're actually on the sea, but they're, on the, they're, they're all around the reef because they're heavy. Uh, and they wrap around the reef that way. That doesn't mean that we don't get nylon fishing nets coming over because sometimes they get mixed in with these polypropylene nets as well and they can drift over. And of course, they can have fishing floats attached. So what sort of injuries uh, are sustained by anything that encounters ghost nets? Well, I think this video pretty much sums it up. Ultimately, what could potentially happen is death. Any marine creature that approaches a fishing net could become entangled and then obviously can't release itself and it will eventually die. You notice that the skin is kind of stripped away in that uh, species there because other species are attracted and they start feeding on whatever's caught. And it's like a snowball effect. So bigger species come like the turtles and the sharks uh, and they themselves get trapped as well. Some of the pictures that are coming up now are quite graphic, so I do apologize, but it does kind of uh, bring across the, the message. Um, often we find turtles in, in fishing nets and we will talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but the injuries that they sustain are really quite horrific. You've got to imagine turtles do have a central nervous system, so they do feel pain, same as us. Um, so this would be very painful if it was to happen to us. Fishing nets uh, wrapping around their flippers, and in the struggle to escape, they actually sever, uh, or they actually go deeper into their skin, and it causes these kind of superficial, uh, deep lacerations, which generally do heal over time. Uh, however, it is a very painful process. Unfortunately, many turtles like this one, uh, this was a um, Olive Ridley that was found and it was brought to the Four Seasons actually. And unfortunately it had a double amputation, so two front flippers were missing. Um, and this is unfortunately quite often the case. They struggle so much that they actually break their own bone, it cuts through the, the flipper and then they lose their flipper that way. We have been speaking to marine biologists in India uh, and it's quite encouraging to know that Individuals that have one flipper missing on the front are able to nest, uh, they are able to crawl onto the beach. So it's quite encouraging to know that if we do release uh, an Olive Ridley that has an injured flipper or a missing flipper, it could potentially uh, nest quite fine. But this particular one, it has two missing flippers, so it can't actually crawl onto the beach. So it would be very difficult to release. Also, uh, it can't really escape from predators. Its maneuverability is uh, very limited. If there was a shark to approach, like a potential predator for the olive ridley, uh, it's not really going to make much of an effective escape. Or it could maybe get hit by boats as well. On the surface, it can't dive itself down, and a boat comes in and, and strikes uh, the turtle. <clears throat> 